principally uh, Matt Cornis, who does a lot of the analytical work for the program, and Jim Webster, who uh, runs the, the actual tagging operations, and the numerous biotechs that help collect the data, and as well as all the partner agencies that we work with uh, to get this work done. So, program over overview is here. I'm going to talk about Chinook salmon results, talk about estimates of wild recruitment, post stocking survival and movement, and then we're going to move into lake trout, uh, what we call the lake trout legacy results. This was the fractional <coughs> marking that we did prior to the mass marking program where we were actually evaluating strain performance on selected uh, offshore areas in Lake Michigan. So here's the history of the program in terms of how many fish we have clutter wire tagged and adipose fin clip. Program started in 2010. Uh, we peaked out at just over 10 million fish in 2012. Uh, mixed in a, a few additional species aside from Chinook and lake trout. Uh, brook trout was a, something we did last year for the first time. They had never been through the mass marking trailers. Atlantic salmon we've been doing under a special project for uh, Michigan DNR for Lake Huron. So uh, the tagging uh, schedule here, this is, you know, we're, we're in, the, in, the, in the heat of uh, Chinook tagging right now. This just gives you an idea of the operation as we move through time. This is fairly typical. Uh, we're going to tag about, uh, about, about 9 million, a little over 9 million fish this year. And this includes lake trout, not only for the upper Great Lakes, but also for Lake Ontario and uh, Lake Erie. So more importantly is the data collection program. This has usually been the uh, kind of the weakness of, of uh, tagging programs. You don't have enough bodies out there to, to collect uh, uh, data on the catch and recover the tag. So we hire uh, seasonal folks basically working in concert with uh, the state agencies and we position them all around uh, Lake Michigan and uh, on Lake Huron and you can see the blue dots are, are representing some of the sampling locations that we, we hit throughout the year. We also send two people out to Lake Ontario to help with their uh, cutter wire tag recoveries uh, there. Lots of data collected. This gives you an idea of the uh, types of information we're collecting not only for the quarter wire tagging program, uh, collecting uh, information on their wild counterparts, and also collecting the tissue samples that feed into studies that, that Matt uh, just showed you. So uh, <clears throat> to date, since the program started, we've looked at uh, <clears throat> over 65,000 uh, snouts uh, and about 16,000 uh, just last year. And this gives you an idea that we actually code uh, for the, in the lab, uh, the conditions for recovery so we can actually uh, keep track of things like um, uh, tag loss at large and things like that. And so uh, uh, lots of information collected. So, he, so uh, this is getting into some of the results for Chinook salmon. This is basically looking at the percent of fish recovered by a capture by capture district in relation to the stocking district. So the capture district is along the the top row and the uh, district where they were stocked is, is along the, um, the left-hand column there. Gives you an idea of the kind of the movement. Uh, and these are fish that are actually captured in the open water fishery. And as you can see, the gray uh, 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 boxes actually kind of align the, the stocking district and the recovery district basically showing that there's really not much um, correspondence between the number of hooded wire tag Chinook salmon recovered in the district where there are stocked. So these fish are moving all over the place, even as far as fish coming in from Lake, Lake Huron, that's uh, MH1, uh, 2, and 3 along the top. Uh, uh, lots of fish moving in from Lake uh, <coughs> Huron. Excuse me. So, this, so even though those fish are moving around or recovered all over the lake, uh, this is showing us the capture of Chinook salmon in the stocking district by month, basically showing that regardless of age, as these fish uh, move through the season, uh, they actually, most of them actually end up where they were stocked. So this is nothing new. This just corro corro corroborates 
what people have known about Chinook salmon, uh, and, and it uh, is uh, constant across age. So talking about the exchange of uh, salmon between Lake Michigan and Huron, this shows you that most of the fish that were stocked in Lake Michigan were actually recovered there. And only about 3% of those fish were found in Lake Huron. The inverse is true. Uh, most of the fish that were stocked in Lake Huron were actually recovered in Lake Michigan. And looking at some of the legacy information that Michigan DNR has, uh, has uh, uh, on this process, this has been going on a long time. This is not something new. So um, wild recruitment estimates, this is feeds into the um, predator-prey ratio. Um, um, <clears throat> models uh, uh, prior to uh, 2010 that was done with fractional OTC marking. Thereafter, it's done with coated wire tag returns and looking at the proportion of, of tagged fish to untagged fish in that age one year, age one uh, uh, age class. So we can see the 2013 uh, number was fairly low. Uh, in 2014, I got two estimates there. One is uh, based on the standard way we've been looking at it by looking at the length distribution of age one coated wire tag fish. The, the one in the red is actually a, uh, looking at the actual length frequency distribution of the wild fish by themselves. You can see they give slightly different methods or, or, or uh, results. And then when, but when we <clears throat> feed these and scale them up, and these are the numbers that actually go into the model, uh, the blue representing the wild recruits, the red representing the stock. We can see indeed that those stocks, actually the recruitment has been, has been uh, lower than in past years, obviously a function of the lower wild recruitment, but also due to the stocking reductions. So percent wild across uh, districts. So this gives you an idea. This is just from coated wire tag returns. You can see it varies quite a bit, but it's overall it's very high. Six, Sixty-four percent of all the Chinook salmon in Lake Michigan are wild. Uh, and let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. This was the uh, 2014 year class. So this is looking at the 24 year class only. This is all fish combined, so 69%, excuse me, lake-wide, uh, all age groups combined were, were wild fish. We can also look at the relative survival <coughs> among stocking events in each stocking district. We, don't <coughs> we, ge we generally group stocking locations within management district. This gives you the relative abundance. Uh, think, look at, the, see, uh, consider these as proxies for survival, we see uh, extraordinarily good survival in WM4 and 5, uh, uh, pretty good survival in m virtually all the Wisconsin uh, districts, and, uh, but, and, and very low survival in some of these other ones. This varies by year class and location, but in general, this, this map codes, codes this where the blue, the dark blue show you where post-release survival, uh, and this is based on captures lake wide is always high in the, in the dark blue um, and always low in, in, the, in, the, in the red areas. So pretty consistent uh, across time. So summary for results, got lake wide mixing of Chinook salmon. Chinook salmon stocked in Huron come to feed in Lake Michigan or most of them are caught there. Chinook salmon obviously travel great distances but still have uh, high fidelity to stocking uh, locations. Uh, the Chinook salmon wild recruitment varies over time and space, but we did have some weaker uh, 2013 and 2014 year classes compared to the past, but certainly 2014 was much higher than 2013. And post-stocking survival uh, appears to be greatest on the western shore of Lake Michigan. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you have much better fisheries there, it just because you got wild fish contributing to the sport fishery as well. So I'm going to switch to the lake trout uh, legacy results. This is a, a, a paper that Matt gave at the, uh, the uh, uh, Char Symposium in Norway this last summer, basically showing the cooperation between all the folks around Lake Michigan. 
Uh, basically, we're evaluating the success of the variety of strains that were stocked in, in Lake Michigan. Certainly, that diversity increased in the mid-1980s. Uh, so we were concentrating on looking at recoveries uh, of, of clitter wire tag fish that were stocked in these areas, the Northern Refuge Clay Banks, the Southern Refuge, and at Julian's Reef, where we were um, uh, analyzing the survival of the five strains, principal strains, the Lewis Lake and Green Lake strains, which are Lake Rimmon, uh, Michigan remnant populations, Isle Royal and Apostle Island strain from Lake Superior, and the Seneca Lake strain from obviously Seneca Lake. We concentrated on the 1994 through 2003 year classes that were recovered in the spring assessment fishery. Um, and this shows you the, the netting locations for that. It's a cooperative survey that we do every, uh, every year in the springtime, looking at relative abundance, age compositions, we're recovering quarter wire tag fish, and looking at sea lamprey wounding. I'm gonna probably go over that. Basically what we did is we just developed a, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, an, an, a response variable, which was the catch punitive effort of each quarter wire tag group uh, through time cumulatively from ages four to 10. We then were looking at the response of this variable to st things like stocking location, strain effects, length at stocking, conditions at stocking, meaning the condition of the fish in the hatchery prior to release, and looking at predator density at stocking, basically looking at how many predators were out there when they were stocked. We put all this in a classification and regression tree and uh, used uh, lots of jiggery pokery to look for significant differences amongst uh, the variables. So we start out with the, here's the full cart model. The first node there, the separation, uh, is one based on these areas, the northern refuge and, the, and all the other locations that were actually stocked. The numbers in white are proxies for uh, relative survival. A large negative number means relative survival or return rate was pretty bad. Large positive numbers mean it was really good. So as you can see that the first note here, we got the separation uh, with the northern refuge where fish are not doing very well in terms of survival and then all the other um, uh, areas. We see this basically kind of shows the relative or uh, the relative survival with northern refuge being significantly lower than all the other ones. So basically it was a location effect that that uh, separated out uh, explain most of the variability. And if we look at the total annual, annual mortality estimated in these areas, you can see that the Northern Refuge obviously has much higher total mortality than the rest of the, uh, the sites. So fish are not surviving due to fishing and sea lamprey uh, induced mortality in the north. Much better conditions in the south. The next node, there's a separation between these, uh, these other high density areas, the Southern Refuge and Clay Banks and Julian's Reef. Again, just repeating some of the data we saw where basically the Southern Refuge had slightly lower um, uh, uh, relative survival than, uh, than the other two areas, but still pretty respectable and certainly much better than the Northern Refuge. And then now we go to a strain effect. The next one actually separates out uh, the post-release survival by strain. And if we look at across the three principal strains that we could measure down there, we see that the Seneca Lake uh, strain actually did much poorer, or actually poorer than the Lake Rit Michigan remnant genetics. So situations where you have low mortality rate, low sea lamprey mortality, the, the Lake Michigan remnants actually do much better than the Senecas. And then we get into things like size. We did have a modest size effect, but if we look at all these variables and, and, and how their variation uh, was in CPUE was explained by each variable, you see stocking location explained most of the variation, followed by the genetic strain and things, these other things that we tend to worry about in terms of hatchery uh, efficacy and rearing and all that really don't matter when you have egregious mortality sources out in the lake and certainly genetic strain is is an important consideration too. So if we take out the um, 
the, and just if we take out the uh, Northern Refuge and Julian's Reef, we can see that genetic strain is really strongly pronounced in the southern part of the lake. And so, you know, that, that, there, there's some important lessons that I'll, I'll wrap up with. That I'm, I'm going to present you a couple of figures that actually show um, how these fish move. The uh, size of the circles are the relative densities. The locations of the circles tell you where the fish were recaptured based on cutter wire tag returns. In the north where we have high uh, mortality, uh, truncated age structure and low densities, fish really don't move much. They stay pretty, pretty close to where they were stocked. Contrast, if you go to these other areas like clay banks where age compositions are higher, densities are higher, fish move a little bit more. But if you go to the real honey holes, the places where we really got high densities and old fish, those fish move and they contribute to fisheries all along the shoreline. This is fish that were stocked in, uh, <coughs> in the southern refuge and, uh, and these are the ones in, uh, stocked on Julian's Reef. So more fish, older fish, uh, they contribute to fisheries and they contribute to natural reproduction. And it doesn't really matter which strain. So this is a comparison of the recoveries of the uh, Seneca and uh, Green Lake strains. It really doesn't matter which strain you stock. They do, they move similarly. So old fish, lots of them, you get wild re recruits. So here's a map showing the uh, coder wire. This is based on coder wire tag or sampling uh, from the uh, from our program, this gives you a percent wild fish throughout the lake. Those areas with the, some of the highest percent wilds have the oldest fish, the, more de the densest populations, and those populations contribute to fisheries elsewhere. So, summary. Return rates were low for all strains in the north. We couldn't even evaluate them. They all did so bad, they all died, you know? So, uh, certainly due to high mortality, Lake Michigan strains in general, the Lewis Lake and the Green Lake did better than the Senecas in the south, where mortality is low, stocking at, size at stocking, stocking condition, and all these other th things that we worry about had really no effects on the return rates. Distances moved are greater for populations at higher densities, and those areas that have high densities and older fish also have more wild fish, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.